Yeah, so as uh, Janos said, I'll be talking about uh, VC dimension and some classical problems in extremal combinatorics and how uh, bounded VC dimension in certain settings really can help a lot with certain problems. Um, okay, good. Uh, we'll start off with some questions that come more from discrete geometry and then move toward VC dimension a bit later, though. Um, it'll become clearer as we go along. So in extremal combinatorics, uh, one general sort of question one might want to understand is what conditions guarantee certain patterns among objects? And a few uh, results of this type are uh, Ramsey's theorem, uh, which guarantees large cliques or independent sets and graphs. The sunflower lemma, which tells us about certain intersection patterns of sets and Samaradi's regularity lemma, um, which gives us a global structure for all graphs. And uh, each of these get rather uh, relatively weak structures uh, in very general settings. And if we restrict the settings uh, a little bit, in many questions, it's very natural that these sort of restrictions occur, uh, we can improve the bounds or pattern substantially. And so these are the sort of the flavor of, of things we'll talk about here. Uh, so again, under what conditions can we improve the bounds that come from these, uh, these important uh, results? And even um, there are still basic questions around these uh, original questions where we don't fully understand what's going on. So there's a lot of results now, but, but there's still many interesting open problems here. So I'll, I'll split this talk into four parts. Uh, the first part, I'll talk about Ramsey numbers. And then uh, I'll talk about uh, regularity type results and applications. Um, we'll see an example and an application in graph drawing. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about counting. And finally, uh, so enumerative problems. And finally, we'll talk about the sunflower lemma a little bit. Okay, um, so what are Ramsey numbers? Well, uh, uh, from Janusz's talk much earlier today, um, uh, these came up and uh, Ramsey number RK of N is the minimum big N such that every K uniform hypergraph uh, on big N vertices contains a clique or independent set of order N. So that's um, your edges here are K tuples of vertices, unordered K tuples of vertices. And you get a subset of size little n where all the n choose k, k tuples are edges or none of them are. And it's the minimum big n for which this occurs. And the fact that these numbers exist was proved by Ramsey in about 1930, so about 90 years ago. Um, and since then, we've been trying to understand how these numbers grow. So Ramsey proved these numbers exist. Um, in the case k equals 2 for graphs, uh, we know that these numbers grow exponentially in n. Uh, the upper bound is due to Erdős and Sekeres. The lower bound is due to Erdős using the probabilistic method. And uh, in the last 70 plus years, uh, these exponential constants have not been improved. Uh, and uh, there's interesting results that have happened that have given minor improvements on both the lower and upper bound. But um, we're still stuck here trying to figure out what the exponential constant is. And we don't even know if there is actually an exponential constant. So it could even bounce between the two bounds for all we know. OK. Um, what about for higher uniformity when k is bigger than or equal to 3? Um, there, 
uh, we know even less. So results of Erdős, Heinel, and Rado show that uh, RK of n is at most an exponential tower of twos, um, where the numbers of the number of twos is is uh, k minus one, and it's at least an exponential tower of twos of one height lower in n squared. So it's about one exponential off between the lower and upper bound here. And it's conjectured that the upper bound is correct, and there's a lot of reasons to believe this, if instead of two colors, in the sense of you have edges and non-edges, now if you have four types, um, then uh, it's known that it does grow like the upper bound. So we don't know for two types, but for two colors, but for, for four or more colors, we know that the upper bound is correct. Okay, so um, let's start with a, a basic result of Erdős and Sekeres from the, the mid-1930s. If you have a long enough sequence of distinct real numbers, uh, then you have an increasing or decreasing subsequence of length n. And one very simple proof of this uh, uses Ramsey's theorem. Um, so in, in this proof for a, uh, a pair of uh, elements from your sequence, uh, you would put an edge in if uh, it's increasing between the two and a non-edge if it's decreasing. And then applying Ramsey's theorem, you get that f of n is at most r2 of n. So at most it's exponential in n. Um, however, it's rather easy to show through uh, many different arguments that um, f of n is in fact n minus one squared plus one, which is one exponential off between the two. Here's another uh, famous Erdős uh, and Sekeres problem known as the happy ending uh, theorem. If you have enough points in the plane in general position, no three, so no three on a line, then uh, you'll have n of them in convex position. So any g of n general position points in the plane has n of them in convex position. And uh, it's been conjectured that g of n is uh, equal to two to the n minus two. Um, this is still open. Uh, Tarsi uh, <laughs> on an exam gave a very simple proof showing that g of n's at most r three of n, depending on whether the triple uh, given triple of points forms a cup or a cap, whether it's con in convex or looks like a convex curve when you connect them or a concave curve. Um, so. We know that, that Tarsi's uh, simple proof gives us double exponential upper bound. However, uh, we know also that g of n grows single exponentially in n. And uh, in fact, there's now a, a, a celebrated result of Andrew Soup that g of n is uh, two to the one plus little o one times n. So he improved the exponential constant. So previously the work of Erdős and Sekra showed that it was at most roughly four to the n, and now we know it grows roughly like two to the n, although we don't know lower, lower order factors. Here. And then one question that's very natural here, why are these, uh, the bounds in these proofs one exponential off? When we applied Ramsey's theorem in each of these instances, and this happens quite frequently, we get one exponential off uh, of the right bound. Um, in these different contexts. And uh, there are many possible answers that one could come up with. Um, one possible answer that one can explore and, and, and actually you can use this to show in these circumstances that you do get, you do improve by an exponential is that these hypergraphs possess a certain transitivity property. Um, and uh, so the points come ordered by say X coordinate in this example and if, uh, X, Y, Z, W come in order, and X, Y, Z and Y, Z, W are an edge, then the other two pairs are also, the other two triples are also edges. And so that's an example of a transitivity property that holds in this hypergraph setting. Um, uh, in, the, uh, in, in the case we saw earlier in the graph setting, we saw that if X, Y is an edge and Y, Z is an edge, and X is less than Y is less than Z, the next Z is also an edge. So they, there's these transitivity properties that happen here. But another natural reason is that they have uh, some, they can be defined, these hypergraphs can be defined algebraically of low complexity 
the vertices you can represent as points and the edges are determined by whether or not they satisfy certain, uh, a certain system of uh, polynomial inequalities of, uh, of bounded degree and the bounded number of them. And, and this is a, an, th there's a notion of, of complexity here that's defined algebraically. And in some sense, this has to do with dimension. So if you can uh, define an appropriate notion of dimension, these uh, graphs and hypergraphs we've defined have low complexity, that they're of low dimension. Um, any questions about this so far? Okay, so here's another example. Um, if you have a, a collection of segments in the plane, um, and you have h of n of them, then you can find n of them which are pairwise intersecting or pairwise disjoint. Um, and this, uh, you can apply Ramsey's theorem to show that h of n is at most r2 of n. Um, but actually, uh, uh, you can do much better. Larman, Matushek, Pak, and Torochek uh, show that h of n grows like polynomially in n. They give, get a bound of, of n to the fifth, and that's uh, uh, still the best known bound on this. And uh, there are several different ways that one can show this result. Um, one way is uh, that, and this is the way that Larman, Matushek, Larman et al. proved it, um, is that there exist four partial orders on segments in the plane. And in fact, this works on convex sets in the plane, such that any two of the segments are disjoint if and only if they are comparable in at least one of the four partial orders. And you can apply Dilworth's theorem four times in order to show this result. So um, that's one way is that there's some order involved. Um, Another way is that uh, segments are curves and each pair of them intersect at most once. Um, and there are general results about intersection graphs of curves that I'll mention soon. Uh, yet another way is that segments can be identified as points in R to the four. So for each segment, it has two endpoints that define what that segment is. And you can then put those coordinates together and get a point in four dimensions. And intersection of these segments can be defined by an algebraic relationship of low complexity. So that's three approaches that work. <laughs> Another natural approach is uh, trying to take a combinatorial approach that they're not that uh, intersection graphs of segments are naturally hereditary, uh, family of intersection graphs close under induced subgraphs. And there's a, a famous conjecture of Erdős and Heinel that says that just under this condition, um, you can get uh, such a polynomial type bound. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So um, just to make it clear what this general algebraic setting that we've been referring to is, um, we need to uh, define what a semi-algebraic hypergraph is. So a k-uniform hypergraph is semi-algebraic if you can represent its vertices as points in d-dimensional Euclidean space. And a k-tuple of vertices is an edge if and only if a certain Boolean combination of polynomial inequalities in the kd variables. So what are the kd variables? Well, each point is a d-tuple of real numbers. And since you have uh, these k vertices, um, you get kd total variables. So if you look at, a, uh, there's a certain Boolean combination of polynomial inequalities in the kd variables, so the points is satisfied. So if that holds, then v1 to vk is an edge, if and only if this. So this is what it means for this to be semi-algebraic. It's not hard to show, though, that um, every hypergraph is semi-algebraic if you represent it in a, a sufficiently complicated way, a uh, uh, sufficiently complex way. So um, we want to understand what it means to be of low complexity. Um, and the complexity of h is the maximum of k, which is the uniformity of the hypergraph, uh, D, uh, the, the dimension that the points are being represented in, the degrees of the polynomials, and the number of polynomial inequalities that you're working with. So in general, we won't really be so, we don't really care too much about the, the exact value of the complexity, just that it's bounded, and what can we use that for? Um, so there's other ways to define the complexity. One could define it as the sum of all these parameters, but uh, um, they're all equivalent because we're looking for when they're bounded. 
Um, okay, so uh, one can define semi-algebraic Ramsey numbers. Um, uh, R k of n with this x above is the minimum n such that every k uniform semi-algebraic hy hypergraph on complexity x in order n contains a clicker independent set of order little n. And uh, alone, Pak, Pinkazi, Radojcik, and Sharir proved that if x is fixed, so for semi-algebraic graphs, and k is 2 here, uh, of bounded complexity, we get a polynomial bound for these Ramsey numbers. So we always have at most an exponential bound by uh, forgetting about x, <laughs> the, uh, the complexity. But here, actually, we get polynomial bounds. And, and the, the exponent here will depend on x. Um, and uh, this was later extended to hypergraphs, where we get um, the right tower height, uh, both constructions from below and, <clears throat> and above. So for semi-algebraic hypergraphs of bounded complexity, the answer in general turns out to be um, uh, uh, a tower, which is one smaller than the bound that comes from the erdish heinel rado type results, the upper bound from below, uh, from above. And this is tight up to a constant, um, up to this constant in the exponent, which depends on x and k. Uh, so this is an exponential tower of k minus two twos and an n to the theta one on top. Is there any questions uh, about this so far? OK. So um, this has many applications to Ramsey type problems in discrete geometry. And there were some later applications that were discovered, which this both lower and upper bounds, which were shown to be tight along these lines um, in discrete geometry, natural ones. So the examples we came up with for lower bounds were a little bit less natural than some of the examples that people came up with later on. Um, but uh, the key thing is one can extend the techniques of Erdős Heinel and Rado and the ideas around semi-algebraic uh, graphs to hypergraphs here. Um, and again, these are for algebraic notions, but there are more general notions. So these hypergraphs of bounded uh, complexity, of low complexity, they're all examples of bounded VC dimension hypergraphs, which we'll, we'll get into a little bit later. Um, so there's a very general conjecture in, uh, of this sort called the erdős heinel conjecture. Um, let F be a proper hereditary family of graphs. So a family of graphs is hereditary if it's closed under induced subgraphs. That is, if you have a graph in F and you take an induced subgraph, it's also going to be in F. And it's proper if it's just not the family of all graphs. So there's at least one graph that's not in F. And you can define a Ramsey number with, within F to be uh, the minimum n such that every graph on big n vertices contains a clique or independent set of order little n. And the erdős heinel conjecture is that for every proper hereditary family of graphs, these numbers grow uh, polynomially instead of exponentially, that you always have these large cliques or independent sets in, in hereditary, proper hereditary. Uh, so as long as there's one forbidden induced subgraph, um, you already have large cliques or independent sets of tower size of the original graph. Um, they proved a result in this direction. Instead of getting a polynomial bound, they got a quasi-polynomial upper bound. And this is still the state of the art in the, in the, for the general problem. Um, it's been improved in some, some special cases. Uh, Erdős, Heinel, and Pock proved that uh, a, a weaker result in this direction would still get you a power size pattern, but it's not as strong as getting a clicker independent set. They find a complete bipartite graph of parts of equal size um, that are a power in, the, uh, in terms of the number of vertices. So every graph in a proper hereditary family of graphs contains in the graph or its complement a complete bipartite graph. It doesn't tell you what's going on inside the two parts. Um, and there is a further step in this direction of getting toward the erdős heinel conjecture, somewhere halfway between this result of erdős heinel and Pock and Erdős and Heinel. Um, uh, that I proved uh, with Benny Sudikov that um, you either get a complete bipartite graph with parts of, uh, of, of power size or an independent set of order n um, in every, uh, in every uh, such graph. Um, 
And so this is halfway between. The proof uses uh, a probabilistic technique known as dependent random choice, which has uh, found a lot of other applications in combinatorics as well. Um, uh, now, another uh, way to, prob to, to possibly uh, approach this is um, instead of looking at intersection graphs of segments, you can look at intersection graphs of curves. And these are known as string graphs. And they're quite mysterious. It's not even uh, obvious uh, that, um, that not every graph can be represented as a string graph, as an intersection graph of curves in the plane. And the, the simplest way to prove this is to look at uh, the one subdivision of K5. So every edge you replace in a complete graph on five vertices by a path of length two. And then if you try to embed this graph, so this is a graph on 15 vertices, it's a bipartite graph. And if you try to embed this in the plane, you can show that the fact that K5 is non-planar implies that this is not a string graph. And there's many interesting results that have been developed about string graphs uh, over the years. Um, they came out in some real world applications that people were interested in originally in the, the 60s and 70s. Um, and uh, so, one might want to understand what happens within string graphs. So there are forbidden induced subgraphs in string graphs. And let S be the family of string graphs. Um, with Janusz Pak, we proved that uh, these Ramsey numbers, that we don't get a polynomial bound, but we get fairly close. We get n to the c times log log n bound. Um, and so if we could get rid of the log log n and the exponent, that would, get, uh, that would have gotten the, uh, the erdos heinel conjecture for string graphs. And the way we prove this um, is by looking at a given string graph, it's either uh, sparse in which it has few, relatively few edges, so, uh, or, it's, or it's fairly dense above uh, some constant density. If it's below some constant density, we, conject, uh, we used a, a separator theorem that's due to James Lee, which improved a previous separator theorem of Matushek, which improved a previous separator theorem of uh, Pak and myself, um, of Janusz Pak and myself. And um, uh, so in the sparse case, you can actually delete a small number of strings, split the graph into two pieces. Uh, so there are these two collections of strings, and there's no intersections between the two collections. So everything in the first one is disjoint from everything in the second one, and you can use some induction uh, argument at that point. If the string graph is dense, the way we handle this is we show that every dense string graph contains a dense and comparability graph of a partially ordered set as a subgraph. And then every dense and comparability graph of a partially ordered set uh, has a complete bipartite subgraph with parts of size on the order of n over log n. So if we could get constant times n, which is not true, you would then be able to get uh, um, Inductively, you can build a large clicker independent set where here you could get rid of the log log n. But we were only able to get on the order of n over log n, and that's best possible. There's constructions that show that you can't improve on that result. Um, in the case of the strings intersect at most d times, so each pair of strings intersect a bounded number of times, you can actually get a linear, if you have a dense string graph where each pair of curves intersect at most d times, you can get two linear size subsets that, that cross each other. And, and then for those, uh, so this was done jointly with Janusz Pak and Chaba Toth, you get a polynomial bound. So recently there was a big breakthrough on this problem of trying to get uh, the Erdos Heinel conjecture for string graphs. And Taman proved, uh, Isvan Taman uh, proved the Erdos Heinel conjecture for string graphs. Um, and the way he does this is you, starting with the same framework. But instead of getting, in the case of dense incomparability graphs, getting a complete bipartite subgraph, because there we can only get n over log n, he shows that they always have a big complete multipartite subgraph. And uh, the number of parts uh, depends on the actual incomparability graph itself. So you, don't, you can't fix the number of parts you use. But um, he gets some number of parts, which depends on the structure of the uh, incomparability graph, and he gets that the parts are all large, and so you can then use this uh, to get this, this uh, polynomial bound. So this was a, a, a very nice breakthrough on this question. Of course, the Erdos Heinel conjecture in general is still open. Uh, finally, we get to introducing BC dimension. And um, 
So this is, <laughs> it's been a while uh, into this. So uh, consider a family F of sets. Um, a subset S of the ground set is shattered if for every subset of S, and there's two to the size of S such subsets, there is some F in your families whose intersection with S is precisely the subset S prime. The VC dimension of F is the maximum size of a shattered set. So this is a, a very important concept in learning theory and in combinatorics. Um, and uh, the, for graphs, a very natural notion of dimension for a graph is to look at the VC dimension of the family of neighborhoods of vertices. So for each vertex, there's a set of vertices it's adjacent to. And so you get, if you, G is N vertices, you get these N neighborhoods and you look at the VC dimension of the family of neighborhoods. And if this is bounded, then you can use this to prove uh, various results about the, uh, the graphs of bounded VC dimension. So um, as an example result, um, oh, I, well, uh, sorry, I was about to, uh, I'll say that shortly, but um, there's a nice simple characterization uh, uh, of fa hereditary families of graphs of bounded VC dimension that I thought I'd point out. You can prove this using a Ramsey type uh, lemma. Um, so if you have a hereditary family of graphs, so close under new, new subgraphs, these, this hereditary family, are, the, the graphs in it are of bounded VC dimension. There's some bound on the VC dimension of all of them, if and only if, in the family, there's a forbidden bipartite graph. So there's some bipartite graph that's not in the family. There's also a forbidden split graph. A split graph is a graph that can be partitioned into a clique and independent set. So a bipartite graph is a graph that can be partitioned into two independent sets, the vertex set. And finally, also you're forbidding a compl the complement of some bipartite graph. So you can't partition the graph into two cliques. So there's some graph that's forbidden who, that can't be partitioned into two, two cliques. So this is, a nice, uh, this is a nice exercise for those who are interested um, <laughs> in proving this as a Ramsey type lemma. Um, and uh, anyway, so that gives some characterization. You have to forbid three different graphs, one from each of these types. And then that tells you your, your family of graphs has bounded VC dimension and vice versa. Jacobs, sorry, can I, so just to yeah. make, make it clear. So here you mean that you really don't care what happens in between the two parts. You just have uh, to have, uh graphs uh, of these three types where you know what happens inside the parts, but in between anything can happen. So, right? so yeah. if you're saying you have a forbidden bipartite graph, the two parts have to be independent sets. Yeah, there's, yeah. Something, there's just something forbidden between them, yes. And the so, same for split graph and... Uh, exactly, yeah. So, so it's not hard to prove that bounded VC dimension is equivalent to for forbidding some bipartite pattern between two sets where you don't care about what's going on inside the parts. And then you have to use some Ramsey type arguments to show that that's equivalent to actually getting cliques or independent sets inside the parts. Yeah, good question, great, okay. Um, good, okay, so uh, what about graphs of bounded VC dimension? Can you prove the artish heinel conjecture? And, and uh, it's still open. Um, with Janusz Pak and Andrew Suk, we got pretty close. So uh, if you recall, for, the, for general proper hereditary families of graphs, the bound is e to the log n squared uh, to get a clique or independent set of size n in the family. Um, and here we improve the two to one plus little o one. If we can get the exponent from log n to the one plus little o one to some constant times log n, then that's equivalent. That's saying n to the constant. Um, and that's equivalent to the hertz heinel conjecture. So this is very close in some sense to the erdos heinel conjecture. The way we prove this is actually by developing a regularity lemma or uh, using a regularity lemma for uh, graphs of bounded VC dimension, which I'll get into shortly. Um, and, uh, and then using that and some uh, rather involved inductive argument using that structure. It's a bit surprising uh, because regularity lemmas tend to have very poor bounds, but here you can actually get much better bounds uh, on the number of parts you get in the regularity partition. So uh, we're getting on to part two. Part two, three, and four are shorter than part one. So we'll, we'll uh, get there, we'll get through it uh, soon. Um, so summarized regularity lemma is a very powerful tool in combinatorics. 
it says that every large graph can be partitioned into a bounded number of roughly equal sized parts so that the graph is random like between almost all pairs of parts. And uh, it uh, gives a rough structural result for all graphs. And it's one of the most powerful tools we have in graph theory. And there are rather complicated generalizations of this for hypergraphs um, that were just discovered and which have very uh, nice applications like uh, generalizations of Samaradi's theorem on arithmetic regressions, uh, the multidimensional generalizations, and, and uh, many other nice applications. So uh, we have to formally define uh, what this notion of, of random like between a, a pair of parts is. So if you have two vertex subsets of a graph, um, the density between this, the pair is the, the fraction of pairs between them that are edges. That's the density of edges between the pairs. That's dxy. And you call the pair x, y, epsilon regular if whenever you take a subset A of x and a subset B of y, with A being at least an epsilon fraction of x and B being at least an epsilon fraction of y, the density of edges between A and B is within epsilon of the density of edges between x and y. So that it looks relatively uniform between um, uh, these two sets. Um, and Samurai's regularity lemma says that every graph has an equitable vertex partition. So you can partition it the vertex set into a, uh, essentially equal sized parts into at most uh, some bounded in terms of epsilon number of parts, k of epsilon, so that all but an epsilon fraction of the pairs of parts are epsilon regular. Um, and uh, Gower showed, so the proof of the regularity lemma shows that k of epsilon is at most an exponential tower of twos, so two to the two to the two to the two, uh, where the tower height is on the order of one over epsilon to the fifth, that's what Samaretti's uh, proof shows. And Gower showed that uh, this is close to best possible, that there are graphs that require this exponential tower of two's many parts. Um, and later uh, with Laszlo Miklos Lovas, we showed that, um, that for certain versions of the regularity lemma, the upper bound proof of Samaretti gives uh, essentially the tight bound up to a constant factor in terms of the tower height. Um, what about in special cases? Can you improve the number of parts? And here's a, another, uh, we'll get another characterization of bounded VC dimension graphs here, one that's uh, not as obvious at first sight. A major drawback of the regularity lemma is the tower type of dependency on the number of parts. And for what hereditary families of graphs can the tower type dependency be improved? Um, so we have a very interesting dichotomy here. If you have a hereditary family of graphs of unbounded VC dimension, so you'll have to contain all bipartite graphs or, or all split graphs or all uh, complements of bipartite graphs, uh, you can show that an exponential tower of twos of height one over epsilon to some constant uh, number of parts is needed uh, for the regularity partition. So unbounded VC dimension, you still have to get these huge tower type dependencies. On the other hand, if you have bounded VC dimension, um, only a polynomial in one over epsilon number of parts is needed for regularity partition. So you have a polynomial size partition. That's very nice and useful in many applications like in property testing. So uh, bounded VC dimension graphs are much nicer than unbounded VC dimension graphs from this perspective. Okay. Um, uh, in fact, there's even stronger things you can say about the structure in the case of bounded VC dimension. That between almost all pairs of parts, the the density is close to zero or one. Um, it's almost complete or almost empty. Um, in the case of semi-algebraic graphs, uh, alone, Pak, Pinkazi, Rokdojcik, and Scherer uh, prove that you can bound the partition you get, get actually it's complete or empty between almost all pairs of parts. You actually get an even stronger structure in this case. And uh, this was extended in work with Gromov, Lafour, Knorr, and Pak to k-uniform hypergraphs. So in that case, you get that all but an epsilon fraction of the k-tuples of parts are complete or empty um, in the set algebraic setting of bounded description complexity. Uh, later with Janusz Pak and Andrew Suk, we showed that the number of parts you get in this hypergraph uh, removal lemma, uh, regularity lemma, um, is uh, only polynomial in one over epsilon in this algebraic setting. 
Um, and one of the, the applications show that typical hereditary properties, and I'm not going to define what typical here means, it's a bit involved, um, but typical hereditary properties of hypergraphs can be quickly tested. So tested in, with polynomial and one over epsilon queries on semi-algebraic hypergraphs of constant uh, description complexity. So that's a computational uh, application. Um, here's another uh, application in, in computer science. And you can also um, uh, alternatively use a, a VC dimension regularity lemma instead of the semi-algebraic one. So you can do this in different ways. Um, so in computational geometry, a natural question to look at is the rectilinear crossing number of a graph. So that's, uh, it's the minimum number of crossings in every straight line drawing of the graph in the plane. Um, <clears throat> and it's uh, a, an old result that computing the rectilinear crossing number is MP hard. Um, and uh, so what about approximating it? Um, so for dense graphs, you can approximate the rectilinear crossing number. So for dense graphs, we know from the crossing lemma that if you have a dense graph on n vertices, the crossing number and the rectilinear crossing number, they're all going to be on the order of n to the fourth. And uh, you can find a, a straight line drawing which is close to optimal up to a lower order term uh, in, a it's a deterministic way of doing it, in nearly quadratic time. Um, that, so you can find a straight line drawing of the graph which is nearly optimal efficiently. Um, and the key tool here is the semi-algebraic hypergraph regularity lemma. Um, you use it for four uniform hypergraphs. So depending on how you embed the points in the plane, uh, whether a four points form a, in, uh, form a crossing between their edges. Uh, so if you have two edges, you have four points, uh, depends on uh, um, whether they're in convex position or not, or, or, or how, they're, how they're positioned. And you can use this uh, semi-algebraic hypergraph regularity lemma to get uh, this result. One can also get a randomized algorithm, which is essentially constant time. Um, that gets a sort of uh, result. Uh, and it turns out that using these tools, you can show that what really determines uh, the rectilinear crossing number is the cut norm. Uh, is, it has to do with the cut distance of the graph. So if you have two graphs that are close in cut distance, then um, uh, the rectilinear crossing numbers are close. Um, Sorry, Jacob, you have about four minutes left. OK. Um, so I prepared too much material, uh, and uh, so that's too bad. Um, but for, as I said before, uh, for graphs of bounded VC dimension, uh, there's a nice regularity lemma that was developed by Lovas and Segedi. It was improved both in terms of the dependencies um, and uh, it was with a simpler proof uh, with Janusz Pak and Andrew Souk and extended to hypergraphs with that. Um, an earlier version, which is a bit weaker due to Alon Fisher Newman, was proved. Um, and uh, well, these few slides were supposed to sketch the proof for you. Uh, <laughs> um, but I was going to tell you about counting uh, questions. And, uh, and then I was going to tell you about the sunflower lemma um, and what happens for bounded VC dimension. I'll, 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 in the four minutes, I'll tell you a little bit about counting, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. So uh, here's an interesting counting dichotomy. Let F be a hereditary family of graphs. So if F is the family of all graphs, and you're looking at them as labeled graphs, so the vertices are 1 to n, there's exactly 2 to the n choose 2 graphs on n vertices. And natural question is, when do you have significantly less or, uh, than that for a hereditary family of graphs? So if F is a family of unbounded VC dimension, then there's at least two to the floor of N squared over four labeled graphs in F on N vertices. So you have a lot of graphs in, in, in families of unbounded VC dimension. Otherwise, F has at most two to the N to the two minus epsilon labeled graphs on N vertices, where epsilon greater than zero depends on the, v, the, the maximum VC dimension of the graphs in F. It's not the VC dimension of F, but the VC dimension of the graphs in F. So uh, it's, they stated it slightly differently, but this is, uh, this is a content of, of one of their, one of the main points of one of, uh, of this paper of theirs. And um, uh, this shows an interesting dichotomy that families of 
unbounded VC dimension, they're a bit smaller in terms of the number of graphs in them. And you can ask similar questions for semi-algebraic graphs. Um, and Pak and Shoimoshi used the Miller-Tom theorem in the version of, in the form of Warren's theorem to get an upper bound on the number of labeled graphs and n vertices, which are intersection graphs of segments in the plane. And they showed an upper bound of n to the four plus little o one times n. Uh, and uh, I came up with a rather ad hoc, so this uses Warren's theorem, which is a version of the Milner-Tom theorem that tells you about uh, sign patterns of polynomials, uh, a bound of the number of different sign patterns. And it's a very nice application and it works for general semi-algebraic uh, uh, graphs. You can come up just like for intersection graphs of segments, there's a natural bound, which is of the form n to the d plus little o one times n, where d is a degrees of freedom of that, uh, semi-algebraic relation. Um, so there's a natural upper bound. And uh, in this example, I came up with a rather ad hoc construction, which showed it was essentially tight in the sense of this plus little o1 here um, is tight. And uh, it seemed natural that the upper bound proof that they came up with using uh, this Milner-Tom theorem should be tight in a very general setting. And uh, recently, um, uh, uh, this was indeed shown by Lisa Sauerman, and she used tools from algebraic geometry and differential topology to show this. And as a simple, as one example of many things of this type, she showed that the number of labeled graphs on n vertices, which are linking graphs of circles in three spaces, n to the six plus little o one times n. So six turns out to be the degrees of freedoms in this case. So you have these circles in three space, and each circle is a vertex of your graph. And two of them, if they link the two circles, then they form an edge. And otherwise, they're not an edge. And the question is, how many, if you have n circles in three space, how many, which graphs can be represented this way? And, and this is a, a nice answer for this uh, problem. Uh, and so, so, but there are many examples. And I just wanted to give some flavor of this. So she proved a general result of this sort. And this shows that for semi-algebraic graphs, um, the answer is n to the constant uh, n log n, um, which, uh, sorry, is n to the constant n, whereas it's much larger in general for bounded VC dimension uh, families. Um, uh, so these are very special, the semi-algebraic ones. Uh, yeah, well, we'll finish here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. It's just that. Uh... Uh, it's it's uh, early for you in the morning. It's late for everyone else, and I ran over time. I apologize. <laughs> yes, I prepared too much. I, uh, I can see that you speak because it's early in the morning. You you speak much faster than. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. It, 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 in Moscow, where it is late in the evening. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you very much for this uh, nice talk. And uh, well, maybe if there is uh, there is one short question. I have a short question just to annoy you, Janusz. Uh, so what did you want to show in the fourth part about sunflowers? Ah, so uh, there was a recent breakthrough on this sunflower conjecture. Sure. Um, so I, this is the whole slide. Um, <laughs> so uh, there was a recent breakthrough by Ryan Allweiss, Shakar Lovett, Wu, and, and Zheng, um, which gave an improved bound for the sunflower conjecture. So if you have a family of, uh, of, R, uh, of sets in, um, a family of sets, they form a, a sunflower with R petals if the pairwise intersections are the same. And if you have a large enough family of sets, there will, uh, of sets of size at most K, um, they will always contain a sunflower with R petals. Erdős and Rado proved a bound which is uh, roughly like K to the K type bound, if you think of R as fixed. And the sunflower conjecture is that this uh, K to the K or K factorial type bound can be improved to an exponential bound, which the exponential constant depends on the number of petals. This is a big, uh, this is a famous conjecture in combinatorics. And uh, there were small improvements over the years. And then this, this year there was a breakthrough which brought basically k to the k down to log k to the k. And uh, so this was a, it's a very nice result. It has uh, some nice ingredients. It's, uh, um, there's been other developments since then on some other important problems in combinatorics using these ideas. And there's since been several other proofs of this that give roughly the same bound, but slightly better uh, improvements. Um, and uh, we, what we were studying recently uh, 
uh, with Janos Pak and Andrew Suk is what happens for families of bounded VC dimension. And it's easy to show that the answer, again, should be exponential in K. And what we could show is almost this. We get a bound which is really close to exponential, but it's in the exponent, we're multiplying by a factor which is exponential in log star of K, which is this iterated logarithm. How many times do you have to apply log to get down to one, which is the inverse of the tower function? It's, for ma in many purposes, it's basically a constant, but it's not. And it would be very interesting to get further here. Uh, we're still working on getting further, and there's some uh, nice probabilistic arguments that go into this, and it's unclear at this point, but if, we can, if one can get further, uh, if we can get further with these ideas.